right, thank you. You can open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 45, if you would, wouldn't mind standing with me. I'm going to read, starting in verse 16. I'll read to the end of the chapter, and then I'll read chapter 46 as well, moving right along. This is God's Word. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers had come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your beasts, and go back to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, Do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones. And for your wives, and bring your father and come, have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the journey. To each and all of them he gave a change of clothes, and to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. Of course, you remember Benjamin is his only full brother. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the goods of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, Do not quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is alive. I will go and see him before I die. So Israel took his journey with all that he had had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob sent out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, their little ones, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt. Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons with him, and his daughters, his sons' daughters, and all his offspring he brought with him to Egypt. Now these are the names of the descendants of Israel who came into Egypt. Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, the sons of Judah, Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, Yob, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jalil. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, together with his daughter Dinah. Altogether his sons and his daughters numbered 33. The sons of Gad, Ziphion, Haggai, Shunai, Esbon, Eri, Erodai, and Arelai. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Bariah, and Sarah, their sister. And the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, 16 persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph, and Benjamin. And to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore to him. And the sons of Benjamin, Bela, Basher, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The sons of Dan, Hushim. The sons of Naphtali, Jaziel, Guni, Jezer, and Shalem. These are the sons of Bilhah whom Laban gave to Rachel his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. And we know 70 is a whole number in the Bible. It's a number of completion. We'll end the reading of God's word right there. We'll save the rest for next week. You may be seated. 
<clears throat> Maya Angelou was one of the most famous African American authors and poets of the 20th century. And many of her works were birthed out of her childhood experiences of trauma and suffering and her experiences as an African-American woman living through the civil rights era of the 1950s and the 1960s. In the 1980s, she published one of her numerous poetry volumes, which included a very famous poem entitled Caged Bird, Caged Bird. The poem details the experiences of the black community as seen through her eyes, but its words have resonated with many who have experienced oppression in its various forms, regardless of one's ethnicity. I'd like to read a few lines from this poem to you. She wrote, A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Now, friends, if you are a Christian, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your gender, you have been set free from the bonds of spiritual oppression that once imprisoned every one of us and still imprisons much of the world. This is our reality. Paul wrote, for freedom, Christ has set us free. We have been reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Freedom is the fruit of reconciliation. Release from the bondage of sin's power is the fruit of reconciliation. Free to enjoy the goodness that God intended for his creation. But our story today reveals that even though spiritual freedom and blessings are realities for the believer, regardless of our experience of them, it can be much more difficult to live in the good of them, can't it? Like a, a bird that's been caged its whole life is, a, is afraid to fly when the door is open. It can take many years for a Christian to realize his or her victory, usually because of some untruths, some lies that we've been conditioned to believe. The title of this sermon is simply Stepping into Freedom, if you're taking notes. Stepping into Freedom, and today... We want to uncover some of the lies that prevent us from living in the freedom that Christ has purchased. We can see in this story that though reconciliation has happened between Joseph and his brothers, Joseph's brothers and Jacob to an extent temporarily struggle to step in the enjoyment of that reconciliation because of wrong belief. Like caged birds, they're conditioned to think that they are prisoners. And only by believing the truth, three truths in fact, three simple truths, will they be able to step out beyond their bondage, out of the famine and into God's goodness and all the benefits of reconciliation with their brother in Egypt who is waiting for them. Friends, as we unpack this passage, if you are someone that I've described today, you're a Christian, but you feel like a caged bird, you feel oppression, I want to encourage you to lean in. I believe that the Holy Spirit 
wants to, through his word, dismantle the wrong belief that oppresses us and wants to help us step into the freedom that Christ has bought for us. It was once said, some version of this saying, that the gospel is so simple that a child can wade into it, but yet so deep that it will take years and a lifetime to plumb its depths. I want to give you three truths, three simple gospel truths to help you step out of your cage and into the freedom that Christ has purchased for you. Here's the first, if you're taking notes. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. This is looking at chapter 45, verses 16 and following. The story begins. We resume our story with great joy in Pharaoh's palace. Word has spread to the Pharaoh about Joseph's brothers coming and looking for help, for relief from this worldwide famine that was going on. And so the king is excited to help. Joseph has done much for this country, and so no gift is too big for Joseph and his family. So the Pharaoh orders the best of the land to be given to his family, and he he gives Joseph the royal wagons, the Cadillacs of Egypt, to go off back to Canaan and to get Joseph's family and his father and return back to the land. Excuse me one second. Now, I want us to put ourselves in Joseph's brother's shoes for just a minute. So much good is happening to these boys. Joseph is alive and well. He seems to be really happy to see them. He claims even to have forgiven them for their sin against him. And then the Pharaoh, the most powerful king in the world at that time, is opening up his arms, opening up his storehouse of riches to lavish on these boys. And then the Pharaoh commands them to go back, get your whole family, come live in Egypt, come live in the best of the land. I give it to you, the Pharaoh says. Now to Joseph's brothers, this seems too good to be true, especially given their past actions. And I think that this is why we see Joseph, we hear Joseph giving his brothers this encouragement as they're loaded on their donkeys and headed back to Canaan. He simply says, now, my brothers, verse 24, do not quarrel on the way. Do not fight along the way. Joseph's brothers, excuse me, Joseph knows his brothers struggle to believe that his forgiveness, his love toward them is genuine. The brothers also know they have to go back home and come clean to their elderly father and admit that they've lied to him for the past two decades plus about what happened to Joseph. Now, I think Joseph, with the wisdom that God's given to him, perhaps knows this. He has a feeling that Jacob doesn't know the whole story and that his brothers will be tempted to explain what happened when they return in a way that kind of sugarcoats their sinful behavior like Reuben did back in chapter 42 when they were arguing in front of Joseph in Hebrew and he was saying, hey, if if you just listen to me, we won't be in this situation. I told you how to get out of this, right? Rather than own up to what they've really done. So Joseph says, brothers, don't argue with one another. Don't point fingers at one another. Don't beat yourselves up any longer. You are forgiven. You see, these guys cannot see inside Joseph's heart. They cannot see that he has nothing but love for them. And friends, Joseph's forgiveness is a a concept his brothers will struggle with all the way to the end of the book. And because of this, they will carry around the mark of shame on their forehead like a scar that won't heal. Joseph is telling his brothers, guys, receive God's grace. You can't enjoy 
the goodness of God toward you in this land if you don't first receive the grace of God toward you. We've talked about shame quite a lot these last couple of weeks and particularly shame related to sin, past sinful actions. There are other kinds of shame. We're talking about past sinful actions and the shame that comes from that. Now, shame and guilt are different things, but they are related. Guilt is feeling bad for bad behavior, but shame is unrelenting guilt. Shame moves into the area of identity and self-perception. Guilt is tied to a specific action where shame takes that action and it makes it your identity. It defines who you are. It colors how you see yourself and your life and others. Shame makes a person believe that they are unworthy of love and never being loved so that when love is actually offered, they cannot receive it. This is the brother's experience. Their sin defines who they are. So therefore, they can't see themselves in the way that Joseph wants them to see themselves. They can't receive his forgiveness. They can't receive God's blessing. And so what do they do? They stay in the cage. Friends, I wonder wonder if guilt or shame has become a mark on the head of any any of my brothers or sisters here in Gray City Church. Because of shame, you've been unable to come out of your cage and live in the freedom that Christ has purchased. Why? Because your brokenness defines you. Your past defines you. Your sinful actions in the past color how you see yourself when you look in the mirror in the morning. And so when you hear all these songs and all this stuff about the gospel and Jesus forgiving our every sin, you like the truth, but you can't receive it for yourself. You can't imagine that your sin is atoned for. Friends, if that's you, I want you to hear me say, Christ, not me, Christ is calling you to a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. Hear these words from 2 Corinthians 5. If any man is in Christ, he, she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. God, through Christ, reconciled the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. For our sake, he goes on, this is how he did it. God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, so that those who are in him might become the righteousness of God. Every person in this room is a sinner. But if you belong to Jesus, do you understand that you are not to be defined by that sin? That's not you anymore. That's not your life anymore. That's not who you are anymore. Sin is not the clothing that you wear any longer. The righteousness of Jesus is the clothing that God's people now wear. So brothers and sisters, receive God's grace. As Tim Keller says so often, the cross is the proof that we are more sinful than we'd ever care to admit, but more loved than we'd ever dare hope. Yes, friends, sin has consequences. But don't believe the lie that the consequences of your sin are a sign of God's displeasure. No, all of his displeasure was absorbed in the broken body of Jesus at Calvary. Friends, don't have less grace on yourself than God in Christ has towards you. Don't give less grace to others that Christ is willing to give. 
Those cage bars don't define God's people any longer. If you've trusted in Jesus, if you've received his sacrifice for you, your sins are forgiven. Truth number one. Truth number one. Truth number two. Your Savior is sufficient or enough. This is verse 25 and following. So the brothers arrive back home. And with typical blunt ambiguity, Moses tells us in verse 26 that the brothers give a simple report to Jacob. Joseph is alive and he's the ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now, everybody in this room wants more juicy details than that. They don't want us just to hear that Joseph is alive. We want, we want to see the brothers groveling on the ground to their father, begging his forgiveness, coming clean about their decades-long deception. But we don't get any of that. We simply get that Jacob's heart became numb. This is a shocked paralysis. We could liken their response to the disciples' response, to the report that Jesus had been risen from the dead. They were shocked. They froze, but they didn't believe. Even Thomas, who vocalizes everything we actually think in our hearts, said, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, in his hands and in his feet, I will never believe. Jacob wants to believe here. For over 20 years, he has been grieving the loss of his favorite son, Joseph. But now his brothers are telling him that he's alive. Could it be that Joseph has been raised from the dead? And like the Pharaoh's invitation to the brothers, this news is also just too good to be true for Jacob. But I want you to notice what happens in verse 27. The brothers come back with their report, but then they recount Joseph's own words to their father. If he had an iPhone, he'd play the video of the brothers, of Joseph telling him, Dad, I'm alive. Look, that's what this report is. And then they roll up all the wagons the Cadillacs, and the provision, and the donkeys, and the clothing, and the money, and, he, and they point to that. And they say, Dad, look, he's alive. And the Bible says, in verse 27, that when the brothers recounted Joseph's own words, and they show the, the stuff to, to Jacob, the spirit of their father revived. Jacob has lived as though Joseph was dead. And friends, he's lived pretty miserably. We've seen Jacob get utterly lost in self-pity, refusing to be comforted. But now, Joseph's own words, followed by Joseph's own gifts, testify to a completely opposite reality. Joseph was dead, but now he's alive. And God has made him a savior, as it were, of the whole world. He sees the proof, and it's enough. And so the 130-year-old hobbling man with a limp jumps up to his feet and begins packing up his tent for Egypt. Again, we can't help but see the connection between Joseph and Jesus, can we? Luke's account tells us that on the morning that Jesus arose from the grave, the women went to the tomb only to find the, the stone rolled away and two men sh in shining white robes, two angels said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Do you remember what he told you? Later that day, Jesus appeared to his disciples. He said, why are you troubled? And why does doubt arise in your heart? See my hands. See my feet. It is I myself. And then he ate with them. And he opened their heart to understand the scriptures and they believed and he led them out and they followed him with great joy. Joy. You know, friends, so often our depression and misery can be traced 
to the belief that Jesus is not enough. We believe in him, we believe in his sacrifice, we believe in his resurrection, but at the end of the day, let's just confess, sometimes we find him to be rather boring. We find him to be functionally, practically speaking, more dead than alive. Oh, oh, we love his gifts, right? We love the wagons, the cars, the clothing, the money, the friends, but these packages are more lovely than the scarred hands that have handed them to us. And soon enough, they will let us down again. The excitement of that unopened package wears off within the hour and we remain depressed. We remain miserable. But friends, Jacob was not content with packages. That gave him evidence to his living son. He wanted the real thing. The same with Jesus' disciples. So they got up and they ran after him. Dear ones, as long as we run after packages, we will be depressed. As long as we run after God's good gifts only, we will be depressed. Even the best of us. I was telling the folks in the pre-meeting prayer about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, the man who rediscovered the beautiful, life-giving truth of justification by faith, was a man who was prone to deep depression. It would sometimes last for weeks. And so his wife, Katie, who is an excellent wife, quite a bit younger than him, a feisty redhead, saw him one day in the the ditches of depression and despair. And so she decided that she was going to dress herself in all black mourning clothes. And Luther finally noticed and asked, are you going to a funeral? And she replied, no. But since you act as though God is dead, I wanted to join you in your mourning. That's a good wife. That's a good wife. My friends, is it, is it possible that we're depressed Because we believe functionally that God is dead. Friends, listen to me. God wants the tangible gifts he gives you to let you down. Do you hear what I'm saying? He doesn't want you to be satisfied with the things that he gives you in this world. He doesn't want you to be made happy by money. He doesn't want you to be made happy by the perfect job. He doesn't want you to be made happy by friends. If those things could make you happy, you wouldn't need him. You would not need a savior. No, God does not want packages to satisfy you. He wants his word to be evidence enough for us that he is enough. He wants his word to be evidence enough for us to get up and to follow him. Friends, if you're prone to depression, today the living Lord is calling you to get up. And like Israel, like Jacob say, it is enough. Jesus is alive. I will go and see him. I will go and return often to the scars and on his hands and feet for me. I will go and believe once again that those must mean that I can trust him. I will follow him instead of the pleasures I've been chasing after after, and the people that I've been trying to follow because they always let me down and they will always let me down. Dear ones, Jesus says, come to me if you are weary. I have a lighter burden. Have you taken him up on this claim, Grace City Church? Have you asked God to prove this to you? Then are you surrounding yourself with people, brothers and sisters, who are likewise chasing after the same living Savior? Are you confessing your depression and your struggles to people in Grace City Church? Some of you think that you can handle life on your own, but it's keeping you in a cage. Some of you believe 
that if I just keep holding it in between myself and God, I'm going to get through this eventually. But you're still behind those bars of rage. It's a simple truth. Your Savior is sufficient. Brothers and sisters, dare yourself today to say with Jacob, it is enough. It is enough. I'm going to the Savior. I'm going to link arms with that guy or that gal because that's where she's headed. It's enough. It's enough. He's alive. I'm going to him. Truth number three. Your steps are ordered by the Lord. Chapter 46. Jacob gathers his 66 sons, grandsons, along with their wives, great-grandchildren, the whole embryonic nation of Israel. And they embark on this momentous journey to Egypt. This is a huge moment in God's overarching plan to save many, both in the literal sense from famine through Joseph, but also from the spi- in the spiritual sense, from separation from God through Jesus, the Messiah that will be born through Judah's line. But we can see here, can't we, that Jacob is a little uneasy. Jacob's a little uneasy about the trip that he's making. And so what does he do? He pulls off on the very last exit in southern Canaan, which was Beersheba. You remember that place, don't you? That's the place where Abraham went after he was going to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice and God stayed his hand. That's the place Abraham went right after to offer up sacrifices to God. That's the place where Isaac went and offered up sacrifices and worship to the Lord. And now finally Jacob here does the same. But he's trembling. He's afraid. He's afraid because Canaan is the, is, is the chosen land for for God's people. He probably has in mind the things that the Lord told to Abraham back in Genesis 15, that your offspring would be afflicted in a land that is not theirs for 400 years. But that can't be Egypt. Egypt is a bad place. We don't go to Egypt. Lord, that can't be it. This can't be the plan that you have for us. And so just before the fires of that sacrifice smolder out, and as Jacob lays down, excited to see his long-lost son, but afraid that he may be making the wrong move, affecting his family negatively, Jacob hears a nearly forgotten voice that he hasn't heard, as far as we know, since his father Isaac was still alive. And it's in verses 3 and 4. Jacob, Jacob, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt. That's emphatic in the Hebrew. I myself will go down with you, and I myself will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Joseph will be the last living human you see before you die. Jacob, this is me, the Lord says. The same God who made promises of land and offspring and blessing and presence to your father Isaac, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. That is where my promises are going to come to pass. And Jacob, I myself will go with you. And this revives Jacob once again. And the cage is opened again. And the family steps out into the blessing of the Lord through the hand of Joseph. All 70, the whole nation, goes down. You see, friends, sometimes the Lord sends his children into the least likely of places because it is there where God will display his glory most brightly. All of the events that have happened, from Joseph's dreams 
to the sale into slavery, his sale into slavery, to the famine, were predetermined by God to save many. In Jacob's day, from death by starvation, later in Moses' day, from death by cruel labor, and all of this will bring about the Messiah who will save and has saved all of us who have trusted in Christ from death, from sin, from Satan. But friends, all of it, all of it has been for the purpose of announcing to the world that God is the God of this great nation. That the God of Israel is the Lord of all and His Son is the Savior of every people. Today, some of us find ourselves in the middle of a story that we would not have written for ourselves. Some of you, year after year, seem to come to places you'd rather not be and houses you'd rather not live, and cities you'd rather not live, and jobs you'd rather not have, wondering if you have made the wrong move. And you struggle, and you struggle, and you struggle, and you wonder what in the world God is doing with you. Why is he abusing me so, you say? You know, Grace City Church began in 2018 with four adults and six children at the time. And the beans kept having kids, so there was more. But God gave us a few precious people in the beginning. Some of you are here today. Just a few. And I remember that in the late fall of 2019, I was taking a walk on my, the sidewalk in my neighborhood, and I had tears in my eyes, and I had sunglasses on so nobody could see me. And I was wondering before God, are we going to make it as a church? We're meeting in this big old school, huge auditorium, and there's like this little cluster of people sitting in here. We had no, no business probably being in there, but God provided it for us. And we knew we were supposed to be in Wilmington, and we knew that we were supposed to be doing this thing called church planting, which... I don't know why anybody would do church planting, but we were doing this thing called church planting, and, and the momentum that we once had as a new church plant was slowing, and the morale was, was lowering too. And I was crying out to God, asking God what he was up to, wondering if I, as the planting pastor, had led people astray, if I was leading us off a cliff. A few months later, COVID was released into the world. And everybody stopped meeting. School districts closed their buildings. We were kicked out of the building. And so we went online like every other church did. And we tried to be as faithful as we could. And when June came along, we decided to get back together. And God provided us with this sweet building to meet in. And then, through absolutely nothing that we did, God began sending many of you precious people, into this gathering. And it's as if the Lord was saying, Grace City Church, I am God. Do not be afraid to go and stay in Wilmington because I myself will go with you. There I will make you into a church that will be able to show this city that I am the Lord of all and my son is the savior of every people. Dear one, you may not have written your story in the way that it's turning out, but the least likely of stories display God's glory most brightly. God has ordered your steps to this place to do this very thing. And you say, okay, pastor, I, I want to live in this freedom even though my situation isn't what I choose. But I'm living in shame. I'm walking with guilt. And I've been conditioned to believe that the cage, the prison, is safer than the outside. That's why a bird in captivity won't leave a cage even when the door is open. He's been conditioned to believe that the bars on that cage are safer 
than the open door. But friends, what if, what if the one that is opening the door is the Lord Jesus himself? What if the one that has come to you promises never to leave you? What if the one who redeems you is the one who promises to clothe you with his righteousness so that wherever he sends you, you will always be in the gaze of his love? Several weeks ago, my son brought home a piece of paper with a bird on it that he did in the elementary class with the simple words on it, are you not more valuable? Some of you need to go bird watching. Some of you need to watch what God does for the birds. So that when you're tempted to look at your life and think, what in the world is God doing? You can look and say, no, his eye is on me. If he can take care of that little brown, colorless bird, he'll take care of me. He'll take care of me. Shame says, I don't deserve God's love. And you know what, bro? We don't. We don't deserve God's love. And you know what? That's why we can receive it. That's what makes us eligible to receive it because we didn't earn it. We can't open the door. Only the Lord Jesus, who is tempted in every way, yet was without sin, can remove every shred of God's wrath toward you. How? By becoming our substitute by standing in our place, by becoming a prisoner in the cage instead of us so that we could be free to live for him. Friends, today, our Savior is not held by death. His bones haven't turned to dust into some tomb somewhere like every other religion's God. No, he sits today at the Father's right hand interceding for us night and day, ordering our every single step. Bro, sister, are you still in the cage today looking through those bars of, bars of rage with your wings clipped and your feet tied? Maybe it's a cage of alcoholism or fear or anger or sexual immorality and pornography and depression and fear of man and every other thing that you can think of. My brother, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Three simple truths. Your sins are forgiven. You aren't worthy, but Jesus is, and he took your place, and he opened up the door for you. Truth number two, your Savior is sufficient. Go to him. His burden is lighter than yours. Truth number three, your steps are ordered. Where God has sent you is precisely the place where he will show through you that he is Lord over all and the Savior of all people. Let's pray. Lord, these three truths are so simple, but they are precisely what Jacob and these brothers needed to believe so that they could receive the benefits of salvation. And Lord, I believe, I, I, I believe that this is coming to us today through your word, by your spirit, because there are brothers and sisters in this very room who are sitting in a cage with an open door. failing to see that behind it is the very Savior who redeems them. And they fly out not into the unknown, but into his embrace. I pray in particular for the one who is bound by sin. For the one who is held by anger and alcoholism and adultery, pornography the one who is embattled in his or her heart, who struggles day after day to wish, to believe, to trust that God is able to forgive me, to save me, to bring me out of this, and who wonders today, why, 
why do I still live with this? I pray also for the one who wonders why they're where they are right now in a city they don't want to live in and the job they wish they didn't have, wondering what in the world God is up to. Lord, the answer is the same for both of those people. God is leading us to a place where where we are will most brightly put your glory on display. You did not make a mistake. You did not put them off on a wrong turn. I pray for chains to break today. I pray for the prison doors to open, the bars of rage to melt away. I pray for wings. I pray for freedom. I pray for joy. I pray for life. But help my brother and sister to know that they will not find it outside of a simple message that Jesus has taken it and exchanges their sin for His holiness and righteousness. Let them live in that good today, O oh God. More and more I pray this in Jesus' name.